I'm David Knowles, and welcome to this special episode of Ukraine, the latest. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. If we give President Zelensky the tools, the Ukrainians will finish the job. Slava Ukraini! Nobody's gonna break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. During our visit to Washington, D.C. last month, Assistant Comment Editor Francis Dernley and I spent a fascinating morning at the Institute for the Study of War, where we interviewed a number of analysts and experts about all manner of subjects to do with the war in Ukraine. We had the pleasure of speaking with a senior fellow of the ISW, retired Lieutenant General James Dubik. Before we dived into our questions, Dubik talked us through his career. I came in the Army in 1971, ROTC graduate, infantryman, went to the 82nd Airborne Division, went to basic infantry basic course, airborne school, ranger school, spent four years in the 82nd, and then went to the 2nd Ranger Battalion, again, infantryman, company commander in the Rangers, then taught at West Point for uh, three years after a couple of years of graduate school, back to the Rangers after that. And then following my second assignment in the Rangers, I went to the 25th Infantry Division Commanded Battalion, from there to the Pentagon, from there to 10th Mountain Division Commanded a Brigade during the intervention in Haiti in 1994. After that, I went to the War College, a two-year War College instead of a one-year uh, advanced fellowship at the School of Advanced Military Studies. Following that, back to the Pentagon, and worked for General Sullivan, who was the chief staff of the Army at the time as a special assistant, to write about how the conjunction of the information age, the emerging information age, 1992, and the end of the Cold War might affect the Army. Went from there to command a brigade in the 10th Mountain Division, and after that to be the assistant division commander of the 1st Cavalry Division in Bosnia. Spent almost a year in Bosnia, Came back, stood up the 1st Striker Brigade combat team, and then commanded the 25th Division. Then did experiments for the Department of Defense, experimental concepts and capabilities. Commanded 1st Corps, then went to Iraq. Then it was 38 years, 4 months, and 3 days later I retired. (laughs) Is there anything you haven't done? (laughs) Haiti, Iraq, Bosnia, the Pentagon an incredible amount of experience in the military, in the American military you have. What were your first reactions in February 2022 when the Russian tanks rolled over the border, the missiles started falling? What was going through David, your David, I was surprised. Yeah. We had been watching it here. I didn't think that Putin would do it. And I didn't think that, not because I think highly of Putin, not at all, but when I looked at how his logistics were not established, how his lines of communication didn't exist, how the command and control was confused if present at all, and how the intent was to use ad hoc battalion combat teams put together, I thought, this is crazy. This is not going to go well. So I thought for professional reasons, it wasn't going to happen. Then it happened, and pretty much my initial assessment played out on onto the ground. So yeah, I was surprised that he did it. I was not surprised how it ended up. Uh, not at all. You talked about teaching at West Point. What would your if you were analyzing this war to students in a few years' time, what would be the jump-out lessons from what we've seen in the first 18 months of this war? Well, I taught ethics at West Point, not strategy and not military history. I taught just war theory, military ethics, ethics and leadership. And so from that perspective by West Point, what we see here is naked aggression. And aggression is a crime. And the crime has a criminal. His name is Putin. And from the standpoint of the moral dimension of war, Ukraine is defending its right to exist, political sovereignty, territorial integrity, and the United States, NATO, and other allies are within their rights to assist a nation in legitimate defense of its rights. Going back, if I was going back to West Point, I would open up that lesson plan and say, here's now an example in your lifetime of just these things happening. You mentioned your initial assessment of Russian strategy and how it played out and you were correct. What was your initial assessment of the Ukrainian strategy and the Ukrainian military and how over the past 18 months, how maybe has that changed? They had to be on the defense initially. They, the Ukraine's military, 
And they did, I think, better than anyone expected. I was not following Ukraine military development at the time, so I didn't have an assessment of what I thought. But so many other people, I thought the Russians were more capable than they proved themselves to be. And I thought, even with the shortcomings that I saw prior to the invasion, that their military was more proficient than really it is. Fails in leadership, fails in command and control, fail in tactics, too rigid, no initiative at the low levels. These are recipes for disaster. Exactly the opposite of the coin on the Ukraine side. Huge amounts of initiative, huge amounts of individual leaders acting on within the overall intent of the senior commanders, and they held them. But I also thought wars are won on the offense, and sooner or later they're going to have to transition the offense. And the offense is way harder to to coordinate than the defense. And I started writing in the late spring, early summer of 2022, what this offense would need from the U.S., NATO, and other allies, a sustained commitment for logistics. Because once you're on the offense, you have to maintain momentum. And the Ukrainian military seized the initiative, pushed the Russians way back, and then had to cede the initiative because the allies had not supplied them correctly or sufficiently. The supplies for too long had been ebb and flow, not a consistent flow of logistics, arms, ammunition, equipment. And so I wasn't surprised that they culminated and had to switch over to the defense to build up again for an offense, which gave the momentum to the Russians. The Russians took advantage of that pause, that culmination. They built the defensive positions that we see Ukraine's fighting through now and took advantage of that. Now the Ukraine military back on the offense, seized the initiative, uh, conducting a very sophisticated, though very difficult, counteroffensive that necessarily has multiple penetration points to keep the Russians guessing. And uh, once again, the flow of logistics comes to the fore. The Ukraine military and the allies who support them. We have the momentum, but that momentum can easily be lost. You don't have something forever. You have to work to keep the momentum. They're working on the battlefield to keep the momentum. We have to work in the capitals of the allies, nations, to flow the logistics to help them keep that momentum. What can we expect from the coming months, particularly winter, in your military opinion? Winter's harder. There's no doubt about that. But winter doesn't mean you stop. The Finns didn't stop in the winter of World War II. The Russians didn't stop in the winter in their counteroffensive against the Germans in World War II. It's not like the winter requires you to stop and go to winter quarters as if this was the 18th century. But it is more difficult. The Ukrainians will have to prepare for continuous combat, maybe shift to different kinds of tactics during the muddy season then shift back during the frozen season. It does take some extra different equipment. I'd spent two winters in the Arctic doing winter training myself, so I understand how to operate in sub-zero weather. It's not easy, but it can be done. You talked about how important it is for Ukraine's allies to maintain the momentum of logistical supplies and weapons delivery and so on. How do you think we do this, considering that this is as much a political question as it is a military question? It was very much a political question as military. And as Churchill said about allies, the only thing worse than fighting with allies is fighting without allies. We have a, an alliance that has held together pretty darn well. And we ought to be proud of that alliance. Did but you that, expect that? Yes, I did expect that because of the Russian aggression. That was the trigger. And it woke up many of the NATO members to say, look, we, we were sleepwalking, so to speak, believing falsely such a war was never going to happen, believing falsely all wars were going to be short and decisive, believing falsely that now we're in an era of gray zone operations and special, uh, special operations and, and precision munitions. All these false beliefs present on this side of the Atlantic also lulled us into a sense of complacency. And Russia woke us up. And the the alliance came back together, and they were reminded 
of why they existed. Uh, the U.S. was reminded why the transatlantic relationship was important. And so the alliance came back together. But translating political decisions into military action is always difficult. Uh, we just have to keep at it and keep reminding ourselves why this is so important. Naked aggression. The Ukraines are fighting for rights they already have. They have had war forced upon them and complicated by the ignominious war crimes that Russia has committed. So this is, a, I think, an important time for us in the collective West, and I include uh, our Indo-Pacific allies in this, to remind ourselves the kind of world we don't want to live in. And it's a world where aggression is permitted. This is a serious war. It talked about the implications of a naivety that came about as a consequence of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Take us back to the 90s. What were the conversations happening at senior levels about Russia and the strategy that should be adopted to try and bring it back into the fold? There was a, a lot of outreach from the United States and European nations to help Russia put a Soviet past behind it to become a contributing nation. That didn't work out. And during this period, the former Warsaw Pact countries, having been under the heel of the Soviet Union for 50 years, probably saw the potential handwriting on the wall better than we did. And this is the time they clamored to get into NATO. It wasn't like we were forcing this upon them. They were coming to NATO. And so the discussion was, how do we do this in the least offensive way to Russia, partnerships for peace, economic exchanges, fiscal exchanges, cultural exchanges. I had a subordinate Russian brigade in my division in Bosnia. It wasn't this false narrative of NATO expanding and threatening. This is just in Putin's mind, in Putin's supporters' mind. This didn't translate to my experience in the 90s. It was interesting you said there that you wanted to, or at least the American calculations were wanting to do it in the least offensive way possible to the Russians. Why think that? In a way, was it not victory at the end of the Cold War? Sure, the freedom had won. Sure, Why but, should yeah. the yeah, sure it was. overtures could, be made? What was the thinking? Victory is one thing. Success is one thing. Rubbing the nose of your enemy in the success is another. After World War II, none of the Allies did that to, to Germany. We certainly did put in military governance structure for a good number of years until you could develop a civil society. But we opened it with the Marshall Plan and other European initiatives. We opened the door to our former enemies. This is one of the great things about the West. We were opening the door to Russia, trying very hard to do it, spent millions of dollars trying to kickstart their economy. It, it just didn't work out. You have to find a Russian specialist to tell you why, but I can tell you it didn't work out. <laughs> and so here we are again. And reality speaks, and you have to listen to reality, not, not the way you want it to be. Another thing you said about your own career was dealing with emerging information spaces. I thought that it's a really interesting sort of way of describing it. What, what were you dealing with, and how is that analogous to the very fast-changing information space now. We, we're going to talk to Katerina Stepanenko, who termed the coin mill blockers, these Russian military bloggers who go on Telegram and talk about the war, and the Russian military defense really pays attention to what they say. Sure. What were you looking at in the 90s, well, and how is it similar? <laughs> well, remember 1992, this is a long time ago. <laughs> I was one. Me too. There was uh, no internet. The computer that, that you had on your desk, if you had a computer in 1992 on your desk, wasn't connected to anything. My Macintosh SE was my mobile computer, and that's because it fit into a rucksack, and I could carry it back and forth. If I wanted to connect to another Mac, I had to use a modem. There was no sense, no actual capability, but there was a lot of writing going on at the time in the late 1980s, early 1990s, mid-1990s, about the emerging digital age, the emerging information age, about how computers could be integrated with one another. And we saw at the time that integrating maneuver, artillery, airspace, logistics would give us the opportunity to speed up our decision-making and increase the precision of our forces and give us more combat power. And so the United States Army started experimenting with that. The Navy did, the Air Force did too. 
in the early 1990s, a series of experiments to learn our way forward. Because as you're trying to go forward into the unknown, there's no way to say, okay, here's where we're going to go. You can get the general direction right, but you have to learn your way as you go. You do some experiments of what works, you plug into your force. What doesn't work, you throw out the window. What might work, you may plug into the next experiment, and you keep learning your way forward. We did that 1990 to about 1998, 99. 1999, we had now a core that was quote-unquote digital, the 3rd U.S. Corps with the 4th U.S. Division, and the rest of the U.S. Army was starting to come along and changing its intricative technologies. The striker brigades formed in the year 2000 as a result of all this experimental. The first a U.S. brigade that was built around the Internet, not the Internet plugged into an existing organization, but now this organization is built around the Internet. First brigade-level unit, and below that could reach up into national intelligence and national communications capacities. This is unheard of in 1992. This is 10 years later. So this is what we were thinking about and trying to translate our thinking into reality and slowly shift the composition of the U.S. Army. And again, the other service was the same, but I just know about the Army. Slowly, as we build proficiency and as real capabilities came on board, Because every military force has to be ready to execute at whatever mission the country asks of it. So it's not tell the president, time out, we're transitioning to digital technologies. No, you have to work your way through being ready today and prepare yourself for tomorrow. I'm very interested in this theme of of decision-making processes. I think for many laymen who have not worked in the distinguished circles that you have, particularly the Pentagon, How are decisions made? What is the process? Bring us behind the door, as it were, to thinking about complex problems such as the ones you've just described at very high levels. I imagine it's quite a humbling experience when you're the one in the room, as it were. I was a lieutenant colonel and colonel in the room, so I was a (laughs) (laughs) note-taker. Still in the room. (laughs) Yeah, in the room learning from the three and four stars that were doing this. And then later on, as a two-star, I had a role in standing up the striker brigades. Luckily, I had some experience by that point. But these were very serious discussions among three and four stars in the United States Army, in the Army anyway, maybe the Marine Corps is different. But the Army, it is not the case that one four star decides we're going to do this and everybody goes, let's do it. It's too complex. The process I just described to you went uh, over a decade. That's three chiefs of staff of the Army. That's three generations of generals. Uh, What I saw the senior leaders do was first build consensus around a vision and then build consensus about a methodology to work our way forward and try to make the most prudent decisions on time as we could and then execute those decisions over time. The big lesson I learned about executive leadership is how do you set up a management structure that can supervise this kind of activity over time? And that's focused on a common vision, so it gives it some cohesion, but is flexible enough so that every year or half year or two years, whatever the cycle is, you can revisit the decisions and say, ah, are we on track or are we off track? Should we accelerate over here? Is this a dry hole? Let's stop doing that. It's, it's a, it was a humbling experience for me to watch, that's for sure. And do you think that's how the Russians do it? No, <laughs> I don't think that's how the Russians do it. Look at their transformation of their military. It was presumed on junior leaders being able to use their initiative on the battlefield. That's about as un-Russian as you can get. And so to build your transformational vision on that kind of foundation, you know is a house of sand. You spoke about your time in the 90s about learning forward and thinking about always being able to think of the next thing and how to fight tomorrow, not just today. What lessons do you think Western militaries will take from how the Ukrainians are fighting now? Personally, something that really strikes me in the British press is you'll see an army procurement story about the British army has spent X billion on all these fancy new tanks. And you look in Ukraine and you see there's drones you could get for a couple of thousand pounds dropping grenades, and they seem to have huge operational effectiveness. That's just one example. What lessons do you think the American military might take from how the Ukrainians are fighting? I'm going to lay out three areas. Uh, I don't know what specific lessons 
the U.S. Army will learn. But I know that there's a group who's assigned just that mission. <laughs> like my experience when I was a junior officer, I know the senior officers right now uh, have people looking at the Ukrainians, coming back, having discussions, plugging the lessons into the current training plan, plugging the lessons into the current organizational concepts. I'm retired now 12 years, so I'm out of that business, but I know what's going on. But let me talk about a, a couple that lessons that maybe don't hit the screen right off. First is the closeness of the civil military connection in Ukraine. The unity between what the political leaders, Zelensky and his administration, and the military leaders are doing. This is a huge lesson we should pay attention to. The more space there is at the top, the more likely that there'll be no unity in execution. There'll be no cohesion in the action. So that's a lesson that I think all of us on the, on the Western nation should be learning. The civil-military relationship at the top, senior leaders, very important. We get that this is, I think, one of the difficulties in, a, in an alliance. When you've got this many people, you've got to hold them together. And holding them together is itself a strategically important task. Even if they don't hold together 100% the way any one nation would want, if they hold together, this is an important part. Second, there's a lot of change that's going on at the tactical level, the incorporation of the information space, the incorporation of drones, the incorporation of civilian technologies that are, that are being very useful, the adaptation. All that's all true, but there's some stuff that is not changing. And that lesson ought to be just as important as what is changing. War is still a matter of the human heart. War is still a matter of will. War is still a matter of cruelty and brutality. War is still a matter of courage and leadership. War is still a matter of motivation. That stuff's not changing. And no amount of technology, I don't think, is going to change that. The third area I put down here was acquisition. You made a very good point in asking that question. And I think all of us as Western nations are going to have to come to grips with our acquisition system being a legacy of the Cold War in a very stable period, stable relative to now, and try to rebalance the two correct poles. You want innovation, you want change, and you want transparency. Those are both important in democracies. I think we've gone overboard on the transparency and the bureaucracy. Not the way I want to opaque. That's not what I mean. What I mean is we have now piles, literally piles of regulations to make sure every choice is fair. We want it to be fair, but we've got to rethink these regulations because they are slowing down the, our ability to innovate and adapt. And there, there's no question about that. And so for us, that's a political issue. This is now something that our legislative branches, in conjunction with the executive branches and the military, have to come together and figure out. We are not in a good place. The speed at which technology is changing, the speed at which adaptation is required, is not the speed of our acquisition bureaucracy. I want to stay on this subject. What keeps you up at night? I remember talking to General Ben Hodges, and he was saying that for him, one of the foremost concerns when one looks at the Western defensive apparatus is if there were a very serious war which would require the mobilization of major NATO forces, we just do not have the systems in place at the moment that would be able to transport things where, to where they need to be quick enough. Yeah. What other things like that, what other systematic weaknesses are there in play, do you think, that we're not paying enough attention to? I just wrote a long piece about this. <laughs> Right. <laughs> published by a military review, I'll lay out three items, three areas. Number one, our divisiveness is working against us. This is true in the United States. It's also true, I think, in many U European countries. This divisiveness in our societies, in our political structure, hinders us in making decisions, hinders us from even taking up the right questions. This plays into both the Chinese and the Russians' hands. They want the divisiveness because they know it slows down our decision-making capacity. They know it slows down our ability to even focus on the right questions. So divisiveness is itself a strategic problem 
that uh, we've got to focus on and figure out how to get beyond. Number two, we have believed falsely in the United States since, since 1991, and I would guess about the same for most European nations, after the very quick demise of Noriega and Panama in 1989 and the very quick demise of the Iraqi forces in 1991, we have convinced ourselves that all wars will be rapid, decisive, and conclusive. High-tech, conventional, and everything else, if there's any other kind of war, it'll be gray zone operations, small teams, contractors, special forces. We have lulled ourselves to sleep. None of our forces have sufficient expansibility now to face a large war. Again, in the United States, we fought three wars simultaneously, two theater wars, one in Iraq, one in Afghanistan, and one global war against al-Qaeda and their ilk. And we never expanded the military beyond what we had. A few, maybe 35, 40,000 expanded in terms of end strength, nothing to wage three wars simultaneously. We have overused that military now to the point of almost shamefulness. And when we come to a point where we need it again, this is part of the recruiting problem. When you come to the force where you need this again, A, it's too small, and B, the strategic reserves we've had, we've let atrophy or drop off altogether. The size of our militaries, active guard and reserve in the U.S. and active and reserves in European countries are just simply too small. Now, that doesn't mean we want to build back up to the Cold War, but we've got to figure out, and this is another problem that divisiveness won't let us tackle, we've got to figure out what is the right balance of ready forces and reserve forces, and how can you reachieve expansibility in the era of no draft. This is a tough problem. It is not a military problem. This is a civil military problem. And I don't think any of our countries will take it up because of the difficulty. The third one was transport. Again, we luckily, we're in a position, Britain, us, we hope all of the European nations, where wars will not be fought on our territory. This is a good thing. And we want to keep it that way. But if you're going to fight a war not in your territory, that means you have to get there. And get there now is a competitive space. It wasn't a competitive space before. The degree of operational security, the degree of network security, the degree of transportation hubs and lane security has taken a whole new dimensions in the 21st century. And we have assumed that we can get to wherever we have to go because up until now we have been. That's not a good assumption anymore. In one of your answers there, you talked about the sort of atrophy of Western militaries. And I wondered, this is a bit of a layman's question, so if I'm wrong, that's fine. To what extent do you think that applies to KIT as well? And in that case, what does that mean for supplies for Ukraine? How close is the West to exhausting the stuff we have to give them? Is that a consideration you, you think is, is a live one? Yeah, it gets at the strategic level, gets to industrial capacity, the defense industrial capacity. And... Once again, it goes back to the kind of original 1991 false belief. If wars are going to be rapid, decisive, and precise, then you don't need much because we're going to be able to know where the enemy is, use our precision munitions, get there. If you need ground forces at all, which many people argued for years in the 1990s, you won't. And then reality happens after 9-11 and reality happens in Ukraine. We let our industrial base shrivel. Now, again, part of this is natural ebb and flow after a war, Cold War's over, you want to reap a a benefit from that war, you want to reduce defense spending, all that's natural, all that's good. But now we have, how should we say, stimuli that should say a reverse of that trend is required. And the Ukraine war is that stimuli. Yes, there is risk now in sending some equipment to Ukraine from all of our nations that may put our own forces at risk. And that's a fine line. This is the same, but Marshall and FDR faced this before World War II. So this is not like a new problem. We have faced this before. So now's the time to say, okay, to ourselves, we thought the industrial base could shrink. We were right for about 30 years. Now we're wrong. 
let's start expanding the industrial base so that we can, both in the near term, supply Ukraine what they need and resupply ourselves in the process, and in the longer term, rebuild the stocks that we have been eating for the last 30 years. The ammunition stocks, the supply, the uh, equipment stocks, the uniform stocks, medical stocks, all the stuff that we had to fight World War III that were built up in huge warehouses, it's like eating your young. We, we've been eating that for the last 30 years. We've got to start replacing it. I think we're coming to the end of our time, and we always try and give our guests an opportunity to talk about things that we haven't spoken about. China is something we haven't talked about too much. And of course, there are increased concerns about China. In your experience and reflecting on the Cold War and on the war in Ukraine and Russia's revival, where do you stand on China today and its threats to the United States and the broader West? I stand in a place that recognizes that China is a fierce competitor and wants to establish itself as a world power. It doesn't have to be an enemy. That's a very tough line to walk back and forth on. Tough competitor, not enemy. But that's why God made diplomats. And we need the diplomatic corps now as much as we need a military corps. If we emphasize the military side too much, we'll make China an enemy. Some people say they're already our enemy. In some senses, I guess you could say that. They are trying to compete with us militarily. They do want to be the preeminent power, at least in their region, if not more expansive. And, and so you have to have a military arm that uh, can check that. But at the same time, you don't want to start World War III. That's to nobody's advantage. And the best way to prepare for World War III is to have a strong military to check that angle and to build up your diplomatic and economic core. I think, at least from the United States standpoint, this new initiative with South Korea and Japan, very important. Vietnam, very important. Australia, India, very important. The Quad, that was a Japanese initiative, also very important. So there's a lot of activity going on in the Indo-Pacific that will help us in keeping the competitor alive and the enemy in check. And I think that's the trick. Will China, or has China already tried to take advantage of the Ukraine war? Absolutely. Will they continue to do that? Absolutely. But we've got to keep this perspective of competitor, not enemy, and work both at the same time. If we start thinking in either or, then I think we increase the probability of ungoodness unfolding in the strategic environment. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. It's fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine The Latest. We'll sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine Live blog on our website, where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released do refer to the podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app. And, if you have a moment, leave a review, as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was produced by Giles Gear, and the executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells.